What if you spent most of your life, maybe all of it, devoted to a religion that demanded much of your time, your money, and your mind? It is our responsibility to be Scientologists, no matter where we live or work, no matter our resources or excuses. What if you then publicly broke from that religion and the entire belief system that defined your world? I mean, if you're a Scientologist, you see life, you see things the way they are in all its glory. And what if that religion then publicly denounced you, your character, and your motives? Well, then perhaps you'd find yourself talking like actress Leah Remini. No one ever wants to turn around and go, okay, this thing I've been defending and promoting and helping was a lie. Remini's own story arc rivals that of any character she's ever played. Born in Brooklyn, raised in the church, she would rise to stardom on the hit sitcom, The King of Queens. Hey, how about this? How about this? I go over there, punch him in the head, and come right back. Carrie, no! Like Tom Cruise and other celebrity Scientologists, Remini vocally supported the church. We are the most ethical group you're ever gonna find, and actually the only group that's really making change for mankind. I promoted the church, I defended the church. The church believes Scientology can liberate the individual mind and indeed the entire human race from its current state of enslavement by studying the teachings of its founder, the prolific 20th century science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. Scientology means knowledge or truth, study of. Hubbard's elaborate belief system involved an alternate history of the universe and a unique vocabulary to describe Scientology's concepts and practices. He is a spirit, and he actually can exist independent of his body. This is one of the more interesting discoveries in Scientology. The church's promotional videos highlight its international efforts to quite literally save the world. What does it do for you, the individual? Why would I join? Well, what you would be told is that you're working to be the better, your better self in all areas of your life. The way Leah tells it, her disillusionment with the church traces back to this man. My name is David Miscavige. David Miscavige, who took over the church in 1986 after Hubbard died. They would call me a word called disaffected which was that I was uh, showing signs of not being in line with the group. That disaffection has driven Remedy to join a group of former Scientologists crusading against the church as passionately as they once defended it. The actual writings and teachings of Scientology is harmful and dangerous to people. After leaving the church in 2013, then penning a sulfuric tell-all, Leah has now taken off the gloves completely. Who are you working for? Escalating her battle with Scientology as the paid executive producer and star of a new A&E series. So how would you describe the show? Uh, I would describe the show as a, uh, a documentary on the abuses of the Church of Scientology. Each episode finds the former sitcom star crisscrossing the country, harvesting tales of other disillusioned ex-church members. And I went through hell. <laughs> Unconditional love does not exist in Scientology. I thought it was gonna kill somebody. Nobody deserves oh, to have their family torn apart because of a belief system. The church describes the show as anti-religious hate speech and has plenty more to say about Remini and her confederates. They sent us this box filled with documents, thumb drives with video. I've seen the most disgusting comments on things towards Scientologists from people who have no idea what it is. Look at it yourself and don't rely on some other third party to tell you about it. All those charges and counter charges sometimes boiling over into open confrontation. You're gonna tell me that you're not a private investigator? Dispatches from the front lines of a war without guns. You said on the show that you actually feel responsible personally given how much you did to promote the church. I do have a responsibility. What I'm saying is, hey, you're abusing people, and then on top of that, you're victimizing your victims. The people Remini calls victims are former church members who now say the church is essentially a totalitarian organization, pressuring members to spend lots of money for courses and books, 
to submit without question to the church's ethics and disciplinary codes and indoctrinating them to believe that Hubbard's writings are infallible gospel. The church characterizes everything you see on that broadcast and on this one as a shameless attempt to profit off the defamation of Scientology. Disgruntled people make better stories than happy people, so unfortunately that's the way our news seems to be these days. The church points out, correctly, that ABC holds a 50% ownership stake in A&E, the network which airs Remini's show. Further, the church says, aside from this project, Remini hasn't done anything remotely successful in years. Would you say that this, for lack of a better word, fight against the church has taken over your career? Many people wish they had a hit show in their lifetime. I don't have to work. I still love what I do. But a big part of Leah, which the world doesn't know, is that I fight for people. Leah Remini seems to be making uh, a career out of uh, attacking Scientology. Just Hello. yesterday, 2020 sat down with Monique Yingling, an attorney for the Church of Scientology, for this rare on-camera interview. Let's just stop. Oh Let's stop. For everything she's been doing on her show has been scripted, rehearsed, acted, and, and then dramatized. So you think her motives here are to make money and keep herself Absolutely. in the public eye? Absolutely. I've heard it before. I'm going to hear it again. But just to run this down, you do get paid and you do get attention for doing this stuff. I don't work for free. This is a, a very demanding job. I'm not going to justify. They get paid. They got $3 billion in assets. I'm not saying, hey, I'm the savior of your world. I have all the solutions to your life. My life is pretty freaking awesome, and I'm functioning at a very high level. My life in the last 12 years is completely turned around. Come and pay me, give me your life, give me your money, give me your children. Do you think David Miscavige is watching the show? Yes. What would you say to him? Nothing. I think it's always like cheesy when you guys ask these kinds of questions. Like anybody would sit and go, yes, I want to talk directly to the camera. Like, do people actually bite on this one? All the time. Really? Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. The only thing I hope that he hears is I'm going to continue to tell these stories. Leah Remini may now be the world's most famous anti-Scientologist, but she's certainly not the first kick, choke, through to the ground. The church has become the vulture culture. The year was 1990. The Church of Scientology produced this publicity music video. Take us from clear to eternity. During the song's stirring chorus, the camera pans across a group of Scientologists singing along. That there is the church leader, David Miscavige, front and center. Also in the frame, two high-ranking officials, Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder, who would later become twin firebrands of the anti-Scientology movement. Fine that you leave. Don't complain about it. Mike Rinder was head of the Office of Special Affairs, dealing with public relations and legal affairs. He left in 2007 after what he calls a crisis of faith Fueled, he says, by multiple instances in which David Miscavige himself punched or struck him. David Miscavige has two personas. He has this public persona where he's all like a politician, glad-handing, shaking hands, smiling, happy, and then he becomes very cruel, very controlling, very vicious. I'll tell you, from my perspective, the person getting harassed is myself in the church. Rathman, who served as Miscavige's number two, worked extensively with top-ranking celebrity Scientologists during difficult times, such as Tom Cruise's divorce from Nicole Kidman. I did little else but work to recover Tom to Scientology and help him get through the divorce. But Rathman told ABC he became concerned as Miscavige turned increasingly violent. There was two other uh, top, top managers within the church um, that he regularly, you know, hit with his fists, kicked, choked, threw to the ground. The church has consistently denied that Miscavige was ever physically abusive. He's very demanding of his subordinates, but I have never seen, and nor do I believe, that he would ever resort to physical violence. In videos like this, it denounces Rathman as an apostate and insists that he was the problem. You have admitted, though, haven't you, that you were physically aggressive when you were 
at the upper echelons of the church. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, we all were. We had to be. It was part of the culture. And Miscavige pontificating on the other side with his uh, arms up. lean back, arms up, big bicep muscle routine. The two left, but they did not go quietly. Rathbun launched a website attacking Miscavige and the church. Much more on him later. Earlier, I spoke with Mike Rinder. Mike Rinder. It's explosive stuff. David Miscavige is strangling you. Absolutely. I'm rolling the other cameras. Meanwhile, Rinder became a familiar face on television, denouncing the church at every opportunity. This is an, an, an astonishingly wealthy organization that has managed to soak a hell of a lot of money out of a lot of people for a long time and accumulated it. Have you made peace with all of it? Like, all the stuff that you did? In general terms, yes. Rinder is now a paid consultant on Leah Remini's show, providing a running commentary on the church's alleged depredations. Anybody who is an enemy or a critic of Scientology may have anything done to them with the idea that the ends justifies the means. Okay. Those two are PIs. In a recent episode, Rinder confronted some men he suspected were private investigators hired by the church to tail him. Who are you? Who are you? He's also spent ample airtime decrying a controversial church practice known as disconnection, in which members break all contact with people, including family members, who the church deems suppressive. Church attorney Monique Yingling told us that when members disconnect, it's for good reason. When someone in the church decides they no longer want to communicate with someone who's left the church, it only happens if that person starts to attack the church and attack their beliefs. Is that voluntary, though? Of course, it's always voluntary. It's patently absurd. It's just ridiculous. You have the choice of whether you want to disconnect or not. The rest of that sentence is, and if you don't disconnect, then we will then deem you what is called a suppressive person, and everybody that you know that is a Scientologist will disconnect from you. If you don't disconnect from a suppressive person, will you be kicked out of the church? No, you won't be kicked out of the church. There may be uh, specific services that you would not be able to participate in so long as you're connected to a suppressive person. Right, so it's voluntary, but there are consequences if you don't disconnect. Well, there are consequences in every choice we make in, in, in life. In this building... The church points out that Mike Rinder has been attacking his former religion for years and sometimes for money. That is in part why, according to the church, Rinder's family has disconnected from him. My son is in that building. This is called the Superpower Building. We paid a visit with Rinder to Flag Base, the church's spiritual headquarters in Florida. When's the last time you saw him? Um... 2003, maybe. This is why I do what I do. This visit was considerably less eventful than this one back in 2010. You, you, you're violating the law. When Rinder went looking for his son Benjamin with Marty Rathbun in tow. You just need to leave right now. You're not welcome here. Sir, you're bumping up against Watch it. Don't bat Watch it. Please do not bat Watch it, buddy. Step out there. Show me the The line. church has strenuously exerted itself to discredit Rinder. He knows that what he's saying is false. It provided us with these interviews with his estranged children. He's just trying to create a fabricated story or something. And I said, I want nothing to do with him. I wouldn't really call him a dad. I don't remember my dad ever being there. Ever, ever, ever. Not once. I thought he hated me. There's something almost Shakespearean about the fact that here is this guy who was one of the fiercest advocates sure. for the church. Please welcome Mr. Mike Rinder. Who's now on the receiving end right. of the office he served. Sure. He was believing that what he was doing was right. It's because of what the church tells you that they're doing for the world that you dedicate your life to something. We mark a new era. Remember that. To LRH. On the Gulf Coast of Texas, far from Scientology's centers of power in Florida and in California, Marty Rathbun thought he'd left it all behind. What was it like for you to separate from this church that you were in for 27 years? It was very difficult. I was seeing a good thing being turned into a bad thing. When I left, I didn't want to do any harm. He laid low here for years. But in 2009, Rathbun started that scathing anti-Scientology blog attacking his former boss, David Miscavige. 
and perhaps most provocatively, he also started offering Scientology services independent of the church. Come on, Marty. Got anything to say? That's when the so-called Squirrel Busters showed up armed with cameras. Their odd hats and t-shirts heralding the start of what Rathbun says was a long campaign of harassment much of which he documented and posted on YouTube. Marty, I'm with Squirrel Busters In Productions. Goof. Doing an investigation on you and your squirrel technology that you're promoting. You guys gonna stick around here? Yeah, Marty, we're here for weeks, weeks and weeks. As long as it takes. The term squirrel is a derogatory term for heretic coined by L. Ron Hubbard himself. A squirrel group is considered a group that is aberrating the technology, delivering it in a messed up way. <laughs> outside yes. the normal channels. Correct. Right. Rathbun chronicled the Squirrel Buster's ongoing video surveillance, driving by his home in golf carts. Watch my dog! Slow down! Coming up from behind in a paddle boat. This is my home, my backyard. Big brother in Bermuda shorts. They rented a house 200 yards from my home. That's the kitchen to the uh, surveillance house. And that is three slots in the blinds pointing at my house. They sent down a group of from four to eight people at any given time and stayed there for 199 days. Why the fuss? Because the church says squirrels, like this woman, are stealing and perverting Scientology techniques, like this work with clay, which was a practice established in L. Ron Hubbard's early teachings. If you want to study a subject and you want to understand it better, then you should you know, be able to touch it and move it and change it, look at pictures of it. They are violating probably the copyrights and the trademarks uh, of the church, and whatever it is that they are practicing is not Scientology. I think the cynic would say that Hubbard's biggest problem with squirrels is just lost income. Reporter Tony Ortega, who's been covering Scientology for more than 20 years, is considered by the church to be, quote, a bigot and a paid anti-Scientologist. He says Scientology feels threatened by both critics and former members who still use the church's so-called tech. If people are doing Scientology outside of the church itself, he's not getting their money. But also, I think it's just a way of controlling the people you have. I told you, I put you on notice, and you heard me. Do not point your cameras at my house or my neighbor's house. Their goal was to get me to say life's too short it's not worth this, and uh, fold up my tent and go away. Didn't happen. No, it didn't happen. If the Squirrel Busters were trying to provoke Marty Rathbun, they sometimes succeeded. You can't do that. Marty, that's, per that's my personal property, Marty. They put together this video of some of their best of moments. Rathbun's wife, Monique, finally had enough, and she sued the church. He's pretty upset. Is he? Yeah, because he feels like you're harassing his wife and his family. Okay. In a legal filing, she alleged that the couple had been subjected to four years of constant surveillance and harassment. What's going on? Oh, uh, we're just doing a documentary. Documentary on? A uh, former Scientology deal. After a while, when they keep up with it, you got to go, what kind of mindset um, is behind people doing this kind of thing? What, what else are they capable of? Scientology called the lawsuit nothing more than a pathetic get-rich scheme and an attempt to extort money from the church. But then, a surprise. Marty began to isolate himself. You know, something happened. He says Rathbun's blog suddenly changed direction. At one point, Marty Rathbun's blog was the single biggest challenge to David Miscavige and the existence of the Church of Scientology. A year later, there's not a word criticizing David Miscavige. Rathbun was now attacking the anti-Scientology movement, calling it a cult of its own, more zealous and coercive than anything it accuses Scientology of. Telling ABC News that his former compadres were cultivating a vicious victim complex and operating a lucrative cottage industry that he wants to avoid. And then last January, the Rathbun lawsuit was dropped. It was stunning. I mean, you know, it's bizarre. The church was as surprised as anybody else when the uh, when the lawsuit was dismissed. In court filings, Rathbun's wife said the suit was dropped only because she lacked the resources, the time, and the motivation to litigate against Scientology's army of lawyers. Okay. This week, Marty Rathbun declined our request for an interview. It's about as 
much of a 180 as you can, you're going to see. But if one older anti-Scientology crusader has now declared a truce, a new generation is declaring war. One man tells us what he says he went through in the church as a child. You were an adult. What did you do to me? I want them to know that I'm here. I want them to know that I know. Serge Gill is not a celebrity, not a battle-hardened, book-publishing, semi-professional Scientology critic. He is someone who spent his entire childhood in the church. And tonight, he's talking about it for the first time. This is why it's so important that I come forward, because I feel like, you know, we lived it. We lived the hell. Serge was born into a large Scientology family. His parents were devout parishioners who Serge says he didn't really see so much because they were so busy doing the work of the church. My first memories of my childhood were already inside this organization. At age 10, Serge says his parents enrolled him in a course which involved an introduction to auditing techniques. Auditing is one of the central practices of the church. It's a kind of therapy using a device invented by L. Ron Hubbard called an e-meter, which is supposed to help liberate you from negative feelings and the trauma of past experiences. This is just a flow of energy that's coming from the meter through you back mm -hmm. to the meter. But once a, a, a thought comes in, that thought, that picture that you have, and is re that is med registering on the meter. Leah Remini gave me a small taste of what she says an auditing session is like. You'd be asking me questions. I would ask you questions. And based on what's happening here, would I let you get away with it or not? You see what I'm saying? Serge says as part of his auditing training, he had to talk adults through traumatic experiences in their lives, including a fatal car crash and a sexual assault. Why would they want children doing this? Because. Elwin Hubbard doesn't consider that children are children. You are an ageless spirit. So your body is catching up to your spiritual age. Do you think that kind of material is age appropriate? Well, I don't, I don't think that that kind of material is necessarily age appropriate, but I also don't think that that necessarily happened. I can't say that it's never the case, but the church has very, very strict protocols in place as to how children um, are raised in Scientology. So it would not fit within um, those standards for that kind of a thing to happen. Serge says that was not his experience. He says by age 12, as he continued his Scientology indoctrination, he was put through a training routine known as bull baiting. Where I'm sitting in front of someone in the same setting we are right now, but I'm 12 years old and your job is to find what kind of thing could make me react. Leah says she also remembers bull baiting vividly from her childhood. You have to sit here like this and you cannot move. So I say, okay, TR0 bull bait, start. So Dan, you think you're smart and bright. And that, do you know that uh, whatever, I guess on you and, and say it and hope that you didn't react. And if you reacted, they go flunk, start. They do it again. They keep doing it until you are no longer had a reaction to that. Leah says bull baiting could sometimes include sexual language, something Serge says he experienced as a minor. You know, do you just profane? We've spoken to a number of former Scientologists who say that in the process of uh, participating in bull baiting, they encountered uh, provocative sexual language from adults. What's the church's reaction to that? I can't say that it never happens or that it has never happened, but if it were brought to the attention of the church, it would be dealt with very strictly and very firmly. And the church does not put children in the situation where those kinds of things could happen because they normally would be in training classes, whatever, with people of the same age groups. Monique Yingling says that bull baiting has an important purpose, to prepare a Scientologist for the intensity of auditing. And in fact, Serge says that when he began auditing, it did indeed get intense. They ask you questions, Dan, where if you don't have a sexual past, have you ever raped someone? If it read on the machine, I would be told to look into a past life. So I had to fantasize about raping somebody in order to answer the therapy question. Did you ever raise your hand and say, this is, this is making me really uncomfortable, I'm too young for this? The problem with this, Dan, is that the adults 
are praising every single one of your moves. They considered me a superstar. Serge claims he was asked that question about rape when he was 14 and being administered something called the Johannesburg Confessional. Some of the questions on there include, uh, have you ever raped anyone? Have you ever had intercourse with a member of your family? And have you ever practiced sodomy? And there are many more. Um, do you think this is age appropriate? So those questions might be appropriate to a 14 year old like Sergio Gill. I don't know. I do happen to know, because I've been told, that he was not asked those questions. And that was because whoever was ministering the confessional had decided those questions should not be asked. But you conceive of occasions where it would be appropriate to ask a 14-year-old questions like that? It depends on the 14-year-old. What I can tell you is that it would never be used in an inappropriate manner by the church that normally it would not be asked of a 14-year-old. And uh, if it were, it was because under the church's very strict protocols, it was decided that it was an appropriate question. While the church insists the Johannesburg confessional is rarely used on any parishioner, including adults, they did provide us with this confessional written by L. Ron Hubbard, specifically for children as young as six. The first question is, what has somebody told you not to tell? Another question is, have you ever uh, done something to your body you shouldn't have? And another question after that is, have you ever done something to somebody else's body that you shouldn't have? You can do lots of things to your body. You know, you can cut your body, you can hit your body, you can, you know, cut your hair, you can do whatever. Yeah, but can't you, I mean, this is a question for somebody as young as six years old. Don't you see how that could pretty easily lead to something sexual? It possibly could, but that doesn't mean that the uh, whoever is uh, uh, ministering the confessional would take it down to a sexual route. But you're a parent and a grandparent. Do you think it, uh, there are any circumstances under which it would be appropriate for somebody who's six, seven years old to be alone with a grown-up asking a question where there are some odds that it could turn into a discussion of sexual content. I happened to raise my children Catholic and they went to Sunday school and they were alone with priests and certainly something sexual could have come up. There's no form like this where there are questions that I think we can all agree might lead to uh, sexual content in the Catholic Church that I'm aware of. If I put my child in the, in the, uh, the care of my church or a minister, I, I have faith that that's going to be handled properly, and I think that's the same thing that Scientology parents do uh, with their children. The church says that, as with other religions, its indoctrination of children is constitutionally protected when done with parental consent. And they sent us these video testimonies of parishioners who were raised in the church. I'm very uh, grateful to uh, have been raised a Scientologist. I took my own first steps in Scientology when I was about nine. I realized that when I was doing Scientology, I was doing better in life. However, 2020 spoke to a number of former Scientologists who, like Serge Gill, say that sexually explicit subjects were a part of their Scientology indoctrination as children. I really question the credibility of those individuals, and I think you should too. Are you saying all these people are making this up? That's not to say that one person might not have had one incident. But the stories that you're being told are either false, completely exaggerated, or made up, yes. But Serge says his story and his trauma are real. Coming up, how Serge left the church and why he turned for help to the very people Scientology deems most dangerous. Finally, I had someone had a clinical understanding of what was done to me. In Clearwater, Florida in 1993, Serge Gill committed his life to the Sea Org, the Church of Scientology's nautical-themed priestly order. He was 15 years old and he was moving up the ranks. I was made in charge of a course room that had to do with learning how to use the emitter machines. But then at age 17, Serge's Scientology career hit the rocks. He was sent to a remedial work program called the Rehabilitation Project Force, or RPF, for Sea Org members who run afoul of authority. His offense, according to the church, misapplication of technical procedures. They come down very hard on things, like they run their own internal justice ethics department. You have to wear black, you have to run everywhere you go, you have to call everyone sir, 
you're considered the lowest form of Sea Org member. After what he says were two years of physical labor and intensive confessionals in the RPF, and another six in the Sea Org, Serge moved to Los Angeles. Eventually, he began associating with the church's critics, which is why the church says he was expelled from the religious community of Scientologists. Was it destabilizing to be out in the world away from everything you had ever known? Dan, I cannot emphasize enough how damaging it is when you find out that your entire life was a lie. When you understand that your parents took you through this whole thing, you never had a chance to decide on anything. And this was all just indoctrinated into you. It drove me to the biggest depression. In the depths of his depression, he says he did exactly what Scientology tells people not to do. He consulted a psychiatrist. Psychotherapy can be viewed as a natural rival to Hubbard's approach to mental health. Don't, don't associate Scientology with such people. Psychiatry cannot point to a single cure. Scientology has described psychiatry as an industry of death. Why is that? Well, I think that's a catchphrase, but what Scientology has worked hard against are abusive practices of psychiatry, not psychiatry in general. You say not psychiatry in general, but an industry of death. Well, sounds because, pretty general. Well, because unfortunately, there have been a lot of abuses, and psychiatry has caused a lot of deaths. Therapist Rachel Bernstein says those are scare tactics, and she says she sees the impact on former Scientologists she treats. They've been made to feel so scared of therapists in general because they've been told that they're going to be locked in, and I'm going to put electrodes on their heads. And it's keeping the blame on the victim. The church denounces Bernstein specifically as biased and unethical. But Serge Gill says his psychiatrist was nothing but helpful. It was the best thing to happen to me, because finally I had someone that had a clinical understanding of what was done to me and what was sold to me. The therapy with my doctor was everything I wish I would have had, just someone that would listen to me and understand me and not judge me. He says psychotherapy finally allowed him to deal with his experiences and also to see that it was actually healthy for him to cut ties with anyone in the church, including his family. He is capable of manipulating, lying, and saying things that are not true. The church sent us these video statements from Serge's father and his sister attacking his character and his credibility. One thing that should be known about Sergio is that he's a really, really amazing liar. There's people out there saying, stop the disconnection. I say, bring on the disconnection. Disconnect yourself from toxicity because it's not okay. This is insanity. There is nothing that is socially intelligent about this equation whatsoever. Serge says he's now regaining his mental health and rebuilding his strength to take on the church, possibly in civil court. What happened to us as children cannot be happening to any one more child, because it's just unconscionable. With this interview, Serge has now officially joined the ranks of the anti-Scientology movement. 